is Amara Hayden. Amara is currently a small business owner here in Portland. She is also a veteran of the war in Iraq, having been deployed in 2003 as a military intelligence linguist for the Army. And as I ponder the madness of Vietnam and search within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion, my mind goes constantly to the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now. I think of them, too, because it is clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and hear their broken cries. They must see Americans as strange liberators. The Vietnam people proclaimed their own independence in 1945. Our government felt then that the Vietnamese people were not ready for independence. And we again fell victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. When Premier Diem was overthrown, they may, they may have been happy, but the long line of military dictators seemed to offer no real change, especially in terms of their need for land and for peace. The only change came from America as we increased our troop commitments in support of governments, which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. All the while, the people read our leaflets, leaflets and received our regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under our bombs and consider us, not their fellow Vietnamese, the real enemy. They watch us as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roar through their areas, preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wander into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American firepower for one Viet Cong inflicted injury. So far, we may have killed a million of them, mostly children. Now, is, now there is little left to build on save bitterness. Soon the only solid physical foundations remaining will be found at our military bases and in the concrete concentration camps we call fortified hamlets. The, the peasants may well wonder if we plan to build our new Vietnam on such grounds as these. Could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise, their, raise the questions they cannot raise. These two are our brothers. Perhaps a little more difficult, but no less necessary task is to speak for those who have been designated as our enemies. What must they think of the United States of America when, when they realize that we permitted the repression and cruelty? What do they think of our condoning the violence which led to their own taking up of arms? How can they trust us when we charge them with violence while we pour every new weapon of death into their land? Surely we must understand their feelings, even if we do not condone their actions. Surely we must see that the men we supported oppressed them to their violence. Surely we must see that our own computerized plans of destruction simply dwarf their greatest acts. And they are surely right to wonder what new kind of government we plan to help them or help form without them. And the only par party in real touch with the peasants. They question our political goals and they deny the reality of a peace settlement from which they will be excluded. Their questions are frighteningly relevant. Is our nation planning to build on political myth again? And then shore it up upon the power of new violence? Perhaps only their sense of humor and their irony can save them when they hear the most powerful nation of the world speaking of aggression as it drops thousands of bombs on a poor, weak nation more than 8,000 miles away from its shores. Here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence when it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment of ourselves. For from his view, we, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own condition, and if we mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition.